this work has been done together with a tier one supplier in Turkey, Coşkunöz, and I have three co-authors, Adem Karşı, Dr. Tanya Başar and Taner Karagöz. I think uh, Mr. Karşı is with us right now. Um, with that, I would like to start a very brief introduction about what I do. I have a small engineering office with three engineers in Ankara. We do consulting, engineering, training and simulation services all around sheet metal forming processes and also different sheet metal grades. Our core competence is hot stamping of steel and aluminum and also cold forming of new generation advanced high strength steels. We are a net exporter since 2017 with uh, a lot of customers around the globe in the three continents, uh, accounting over 60%. I'm also writing in metal forming magazine since 2020. My uh, column is called Cutting Edge. It's more industry uh, related articles, not academic work. And I also recently contributed to World Auto Steel's AHSS guidelines. Uh, the main editor, technical editor, Danny Schaffler is with us as well right now, and he will talk uh, more about the application guidelines in the coming next hours. Very brief introduction to my um, um, collaborators company. It's founded in 1968 as one of the first year one suppliers and dye makers in Turkey. There is a separate dye making company that was uh, formed in 1983. The group right now owns a total of 12 companies. Five of them are in automotive sector around the globe. And they supply parts and dyes to numerous OEMs, again, around the globe. And they have one of the most advanced R&D facilities in metal forming research in Turkey, including uh, test equipment and simulation software. So those of you who were at MSDM in 2020, this is a slide from my last year's uh, presentation, actually. I had this question, how much does it cost to simulate a new steel grade? So it's great that Professor Krizan and his team is developing these medium manganese grades, and they look very promising, but how much time and effort and money it takes for us to put that into autoform or PAM stamp or stamp -X simulations? The easiest way, I mean, the minimum, we need several tensile tests, at least in three directions uh, with respect to rolling direction. We typically need a balanced biaxial test to get a better um, uh, yield locus. We may need Nagajima tests to get the FLC forming limit curve. And in some cases, we may even need gizmo or similar fracture models with a number of different um, specimen types and digital image correlation. So it's not always possible to put all of this effort when, you, when there's a new steel grade. And of course, there's load unload or tension compression tests for spring back predictions. So this will be my agenda today. I would like to talk briefly about process and material data required in metal forming simulations. Then I will discuss about the multi-level material cards or simulation models. Why do we need them? What would be the benefit? I will show an experimental validation on a Gen 3 advanced high strength steel part that was uh, stamped at Joshkunos, and I will talk about conclusions and future work. So this is a short table. I get this from Carl Roll. He was uh, an engineer at Daimler Chrysler, and I think he is still a professor. I like it a lot because it shows what we assume in metal forming simulations. What else? and what we have in shop floor. We always assume the metal form, um, sheet metal properties are simple and they are constant within the coil or between different coils. In reality, it's not like that. We typically assume the press speed to be constant or we even neglect it as there, there would be no effect of uh, press speed. But in reality, most people know that as you increase the production rate, you may see more splits or wrinkles or uh, different spring back conditions. Friction between the tool and sheet, we used to consider, it con consider that constant. Only recently there is tribology add-on software that you can add on your uh, metal forming simulation that would give you a variable friction coefficient around your punch or die surfaces, which makes you uh, free of this constant constant friction coefficient idea. In reality, it depends on oil quantity, how many grams per meter square oil you have on the steel, 
It could be as delivered or could be sprayed. Surface roughness of the tool and the blank itself. Contact pressure, sliding velocity and average temperature in the uh, sliding zone. Talking about temperature, in reality increases due to heat generation. This could be because of plastic deformation and friction, but we typically consider uh, friction to be, con uh, I'm sorry, temperature to be constant. And in reality, tool and press are elastically deforming, but we typically consider them as rigid. So in automotive industry, one of the most common methods for metal forming simulation is receiving a material card from the material supplier or the OEM and assuming constant friction, neglecting press speed, this will be the simplest way of making simulation. But this is what we call as level zero. So here you see all of the data we need to make a metal forming simulation. Some of them are included in a material card and some of them are processed data. So when you have a material supplier or OEM giving you the material card, they typically give you a hardening curve a yield locus and an FLC. And we consider this as constant for all the coils from this specific supplier, head to tail, but in reality, different coils typically may have different scrap rates. That's very common. And within a coil, mechanical properties may not be constant from head to tail. Other than that, we may need strain rate or temperature dependent data, typically not included. Kinematic hardening, typically not included. Failure or fracture maximum edge strain. This is a relatively new addition to metal forming software uh, where we try to estimate edge cracks, such in the case of uh, hole flanging or uh, stretch bending or similar local uh, cracks. Friction model is typically constant and press is uh, most of the time neglected. Nobody cares if it's a mechanical press with 50 strokes per minute or if it's a servo press with slowing down motion, that's typically neglected. And this is typically neglected because materials strain rate sensitivity is unknown, so it makes no difference if you go fast or slow. Friction coefficient, if it is not dependent on sliding velocity, you don't need to know the press speed. And if you don't have temperature effects, again, you can neglect the press machine. But in reality, as I told earlier, press SPM, strokes per minute, which directly affects the pro productivity, affects part quality, and typically uh, OEMs or tier suppliers invest in expensive link motion or servo drive presses, which offer significant advantages, but without having the friction model and the press inside your simulation, you cannot uh, get these details. So that brings us to our multi-level material cards. What we discussed in the in initial idea is that let's have several levels or blocks of tests that we will do for sheet metal forming simulation. And level one would be the cheapest and fastest. What we do is only three directional tensile tests. We must record the plastic anisotropy with respect to uh, ISO 10113 and we advise DIC at least in rolling direction if possible and according to the new ISO standard if the material uh, has um, a jerk motion uh, like luder bands or similar then DIC is a must and what we advise is a mixed model extrapolation. So in level one we only have real test data for hardening curve since we have an isotropy, we can get Hill for 1948, that's a 65-year-old uh, yield locus. And we can estimate FLC by using um, steel makers macros. And then we, again, do not include any of the other uh, data, whether it's material or process. Here you can see an experimental work that we did. This is a 1.5 millimeter uncoated Gen 3 980 meg megapascal grade. We did three repetitions in three directions, and what you see here is the rolling direction with three repetitions. And then we uh, fit combined Swift Hockett Sherby model. That's the black one, is our uh, curve fit for the metal forming simulation because most simulations require us a true plastic strain up, up to one to start with the uh, simulation. 
And here is a simple yield locus. Sorry about the quality of this curve. But in low level cards, the best, the easiest to use is Hill 48. But this model is not advised for materials with R values less than one. And in this particular case, the Gen 3 980 megapascal grade had all of it, all of its R values, 0, 45, and 90, less than one. So this was not really advised. And again, in low level cards, we typically use FLCs using the macro. Uh, here we use upspells method. It's also known as Tata Steel macro in the industry. What we need is the A80 total elongation values and R plastic and isotropic coefficients in three directions. That brings us to level two. Our idea was that if we want to have press SPM optimization, we should have at least strain rate test, which is just a small addition to the previous data set. Uh, we ad advise at least three tensile tests at three different strain rates. And then uh, the press stroke time curve is also modeled. And if material itself may have some SPM related problems, we hope this can solve it. But real SPM optimizations definitely requires friction as a function of velocity and if possible, thermal data as well. Here you can see three different strain rates tested. And I know it's not easy to see, but I think when we zoom into this small uh, rectangle, what you can see is that the blue is the uh, slowest test and the black is the fastest test. We can fit a constant M value and feed this into our metal forming simulation. And the next thing is to put the mechanical press, how it really uh, closes the slide in real time. So this, this case was in 16 SPM, but it could be adjusted. And we used a press pro software developed at Builder Metal Form to generate these curves and we can export them directly to AutoForm software. Then comes level three. Here we add the bulge test so that we have better yield locus. Uh, it could be Bana Beach model 2005 or Vector Light. This is, I think, 2017 Chorus Vector model. We put uh, experimental FLC based on ISO standard 12004. And then we also conducted friction tests to have a friction coefficient as a function of contact pressure and sliding velocity. So our idea was to be able to see better thickness distributions especially SPM dependent on this level. So better thickness distribution and press form force estimation, SPM effects may be caught better and splits may be caught better was the idea. So friction tests were done at Joshkunos with various contact pressure levels and various sliding velocity levels. And we made a fit of friction as a function of uh, sliding velocity and contact pressure. Here you just see uh, two different pressures and uh, sliding velocity from 0 to 100 millimeters per second. We improved the yield locus by using the um, uh, bulge test data. Here you can see Banabich model fit with experimental biaxial data. Well, for this particular Gen 3 steel, Hill 48 and Banabich 2005 seem to be very close to each other, but you can still see there is a slight difference in the uh, biaxial zones. And in addition to that, we come up with level four, and I will show you level four and level zero, actually. Here, what we did is uh, we added Yoshida Uamori model for kinematic hardening, and we also added unloading modulus changing with plastic strain. So the improvement here is significantly improved springback predictions. But as you can see, you will see a yellow here because um, many software, including Autoform and Stampack, does not allow us to put the hardening curve from test and extrapolation. They ask us to make the Yoshida fit, which may deterior deteriorate a little bit uh, the hardening curve data. So I put that in yellow color. Here you see our load unload tests. These are done experimentally to determine the unloading modulus as a function of plastic strain. And once we have this data, we can fit that into a modulus decrease model proposed by Yoshida. 
as you can see, our three different um, experiments and the red curve, uh, the decrease model proposed by Yoshida. And then we have the tension compression tests. I hope the videos will run correctly. Um, it starts just like a standard tensile test. It continues just like a load unload test. Until here, we don't apply any compressive force. So there's no risk of buckling. We don't need any special um, um, grips or anti-buckling devices. The problem starts right after this. Once we go to compressive stresses, we need special grips that can handle compressive forces. Most universal tensile test machines, although they may be set, sold as tension compression universal test machines, they cannot handle sheet metal compression. Most of the grips are designed in one direction, and when, when you try to compress them, they just slip. So it requires special grips and may require an anti-buckling device. So we did this from level zero to level four, and we run a number of different simulations. Uh, the idea was to validate the idea on a real part. So what we did is we designed a part that would look like an automotive part, has an S shape so that we can model stretch and shrink flanging areas. If needed, we can put just strips to make U-bends or stretch and shrink flanges. And we also have a modified S shape for further thinning the material at the top area. So we made a, a modular die design in Katia and produced the die. Then in reality, this is what we do. We have the uh, forming simulation, uh, forming operation. This is what you see after the part is removed from the press. So there is actually a spring back. And then, then we laser cut the final part to have an open shape so that it will have more spring back once it's laser cut. And we did uh, three dimensional visual scans after OP 15 and OP 25. And we compare this with our simulations. We also did circle grid analysis, but I'm sorry I couldn't uh, finish the analysis until now, so they won't be here. But I'm hoping I will add them into my paper. Here, what we see is the measurement points from 0 to 184 and the 3D distance between the simulation and experiment. So what we did is we have the GOM ATOS uh, scanning of the data, the real part, and we compare that to our autoform um, uh, results. And what you see here, this is just sorted data. So every data, uh, data 20 has more uh, 3D distance than data 19, etc. So it's sorted data. And what you will see here is that only 32% of these pre-selected points have less than 0.5 millimeter deviation between the simulation and experiment. And about 48% of them has less than uh, one millimeter deviation. Now, I'm sorry, this must be level four. This is level four material card with Yoshida Uemori model that we spent more time and effort to generate. But now we have about 60% of the points less than 0.5 millimeter deviation. And almost 94% of the points have less than one millimeter deviation. By the way, these 0.5 and one are typical thresholds used in automotive industry. So with that, I would like to come to my conclusions and future work. First of all, we will con continue on comparison of minor and major strain distribution, since we also did the circle grid analysis of these parts. We will try experimentally splitting the part with increasing blank holder force, and we will try to estimate the splitting blank holder force tonnage in our simulations and SPM effects will be further investigated. We also have a proposed level five where we would like to in include the Triboform plugin, which has a much more uh, sophisticated friction model. And we also want to add Diabolo test or similar to get the edge strain, uh, maximum edge strain for failure and fracture. Sorry. I'm also working on another study as heat generation and its effects. As you can see here, you see a DP1000 uh, steel 
uh, it must be a room temperature um, tensile test, but in reality that the fracture zone, the temperature may go up to 100 degrees or so. I recently made an industrial article, and here you can see once the press for, uh, forming starts, after a few hundred parts, we typically may see a split due to heat generation, and we, we may need to reduce the blank holder force. So we want to see this effect as well, because this will affect how, what speed I can run my press at, what my part productivity will be. And also another continuous, continuing study is how to handle the material variability. This is a um, micromagnetic measurement of yield strength within th three different coils of, I think it was CR3 or CR4. It's a deep row called steel. And as you can see, the yield strength is not constant from head to tail and be between coil and coil. So we are looking forward to work on this area as well. Those are thickness and oil film thicknesses. To summarize, uh, a full material and process characterization may be very time consuming and costly. And depending on the phase of the project, if it's coating, if it's feasibility, or if it's just before uh, machining the dies, different levels of simulations may be developed. Springback modeling can be improved significantly with tension compression tests and decaying unloading modulus. SPM optimizations may require further thermal considerations. What I mean by that is heat generation, uh, heat accumulation, and their effects on friction uh, distribution and material properties. And a digital driven of the coil or an online measurement is required to handle coil to coil and intra coil variations. With that, I'm done with my presentation. I would be very happy if you have any questions. And it looks like I'm just two minutes uh, over my time. So a very quick question. Uh, where you had to adjust the clamping force because uh, the temperature rose during coal forming. Did that steel, uh, what kind of steel was it? Uh, was it a trip assisted steel or something like that? Are we talking about the sheet metal? Yes. Yes, it's a trip assisted 980 megapascal tensile strength material. Okay, so a uh, yes, 100 so degree ahead. centigrade uh, change, which you highlighted roughly, yes. uh, has a significant effect on the stability of the austenite. Uh, it's very easy to demonstrate just by doing a tensile test at zero degree, uh, at room temperature and at 100 degrees. And that might be the mechanism um, by the way, just to clarify, the, uh, the, the tensile test was done at room temperature, but since there is plastic deformation, uh, the areas with high plastic deformation locally reaches 100 degrees, not the whole part. Okay. You can, okay. But this is often neglected. And by the way, although this is a trip assisted steel, we did not really look into transformation induced uh, strains. So I know we have more details to go on with, but it's again, uh, from the industrial point of view, it's a lot of effort and money. From academic point of view, I'm totally agreeing with you, but for industrial use, this is uh, too much detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments?